welcome to First Look, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading or readings for the coming Sunday. My name is Carl and it's good to have you with us. This week we're looking at a passage in which Jesus' authority is implicitly questioned and we'll be thinking about what it means for him to be the Good Shepherd. Before we dive into any of that, however, if you've not done so already, you may find it useful to download the sheet that accompanies this study, and you'll find the link for that in the YouTube video description. On the sheet, you will find the text of today's reading, some other passages you may wish to look up, the questions we'll be considering together later on, and lots of room for you to record your own thoughts and observations. And so without further ado, let us dive into today's passage, which comes from John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 22 to 30. Jesus had just been involved in a confrontation with some Pharisees in the vicinity of Jerusalem, having healed a blind man on the Sabbath day who was then met with disbelief when he tried to tell others what Jesus had done for him, as we see in chapter 9, verses 1 to 12. The Pharisees, when the blind man was brought to them, questioned both him and his parents, as we see in verses 13 through to 33, before driving him out because of his defence of Jesus, as we see in verse 34. Jesus then spoke to the blind man and called the Pharisees out for their blindness to what God was doing through him. You see in verses 35 to 41. It's that confrontation that sets the scene for the teaching we see in chapter 10. And in verses 1 to 18, we have two little sections in which Jesus talks about being the good shepherd and the gate to the sheepfold. This was directed towards those hostile Pharisees, and they were sharply divided, as we learn in verses 19 to 21 of chapter 10, by his words. Some asked, well, how could he be demon-possessed if he can heal the blind? Whereas others were quite convinced that he was possessed, and therefore a deeply dangerous character. Today's passage follows on from this and continues the theme of the Good Shepherd. Jesus, as we learn in verse 22, is in the Jerusalem temple for the Festival of Dedication, or Hanukkah, which is now known as the Festival of Light because it involves lanterns. It was a relatively new festival, initiated in the year 164 BCE, to remember the rededication of the Second Temple, following its um, being defiled by Antiochus IV. And you can read about the defilement and the restoration in 1 Maccabees, chapter 1, verses 54 to 61, and then chapter 4, verses 36 to 59, respectively. Not only is this location in time important, and John's Gospel tells us that this episode happened in the winter months, but also the geographical setting is important. We learn in verse 23 that the action today took place, takes place around Solomon's porch. It was on the east side of the temple and it was called the porch of judgment because that is where the king would dispense judgment and bring justice from. It shows us therefore Jesus as the one who embodied God's justice in his person being cast as judge and also as a royal figure. Again, themes that run throughout in their different ways, John's Gospel. In this passage, we have Jesus in the midst of his teaching in the temple complex. And we also have the temple establishment, which is what it means when John's Gospel refers to the Jews. And no doubt it would have included some of those Pharisees with whom Jesus had been in confrontation the Pharisees being part of one of the biggest and most powerful subgroups within the lively Judaism of the day. We know that John's Gospel was written around 90 to 95 of the Common Era and contains a great deal of theological reflection that takes us beyond 
what we find in the Synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew and Luke. It was also a point at which church and synagogue were very much going their separate ways following the destruction of the temple in the year 70. And I think that background sets the scene for some of the hostility that's depicted between Jesus and the religious authorities in this conflict narrative. And at the heart of the passage is a question about Jesus' identity in relation to the Father. Now, as readers, we already know from right from the beginning, from the prologue to John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 to 14, about something of the relationship between Jesus and God the Father. But by the point we've got to in the story, Jesus' identity has been subjected to fierce debate. And one commentator argued that he was getting tired and fed up of all of this speculation about who he was. Gradually, as we work our way through John's Gospel, we see Jesus being identified in different ways and different parts of his significance being revealed. So, for example, in chapter 1, verses 37 to 41, when some of the earliest disciples were being called, they refer to him as rabbi, as teacher, and also as messiah. Nathaniel, again among the first disciples, in one fantastic sentence in chapter 1, verse 49, refers to Jesus as Rabbi, as Son of God, and as King of Israel. And in that section, the accolades build up and build up. Stepping forward a bit in the story of the Gospel, we have Nicodemus recognising Jesus as a teacher from God in chapter 3, verse 2. And the Samaritan woman that Jesus talks with at the well referred to him as Prophet and Messiah in chapter 4, verses 19 and 29, respectively. The crowd at the feeding of the 5,000 wanted to make Jesus their king by force, as we see in chapter 6, verses 14 to 15. And we know that the blind man that Jesus had healed um, called him Lord, as we see in chapter 9, verse 38. So we've got a variety of positive images that were used for Jesus. But from very early on, in John's Gospel, we see conflicts between Jesus and other Jewish leaders. And he is treated with hostility by many. So, for example, in chapter 7, verse 12, he's referred to as a deceiver. He's referred to as demon possessed several times in chapter 7, verse 20, in chapter 8, verse 48, and chapter 8, verse 52, for instance. Again in chapter 8, in verses 57 to 59, Jesus is referred to as a blasphemer. And he's referred to in chapter 9, verses 16 and 24, as a sinner for being perceived as breaking the Sabbath. So he was a divisive figure. And it feeds through into the way he portrays himself in today's passage. Now we're told in verse 24 having set the scene in terms of time and in terms of space, that members of the temple establishment were circling around Jesus when he was in the porch of Solomon and basically saying, look, don't keep us in suspense any longer, Jesus. Tell us plainly, are you the Messiah? Jesus' response in verse 25 is twofold and I think expresses some of his frustrations. First part of the verse, he notes that he had already stated matters plainly on several occasions, but they hadn't listened to him. And in the second part of verse 25, he noted that he performed various works in the Father's name that testified to who he is. He'd already used that argument in Bathsheba in chapter 5, verses 36 to 38. And he'd go on to extend it in chapter 10, verses 37 to 38, and chapter 14, verses 9 to 11, in which he said that those who were not convinced by his words should look at his deeds in order to identify who he was. Now, this questioning that Jesus was subjected to came down to two issues, really. Who are you and where does your authority come from? They were effectively seeking to know whether Jesus really was from God. 
And in verse 26, when he tells them that they were not among his sheep, he was effectively reinforcing the critique of chapter 9, verse 40, pointing out their blindness again to who he was. And in the process, he thus actually asserted his authority as God's Messiah, God's anointed one. In verse 27, Jesus talks about the sheep, his sheep, knowing his voice. And that follows earlier statements that he's made in chapter 10, verses 4 and 14 about being the good shepherd. So this imagery continues to feed through. And he states in verse 28, both his capacity to give eternal life, something that begins in the here and now and continues beyond death, and also about his ability to preserve the lives of those who are faithful to him. And as we learn in verse 29, he can only do these things because he has been given the capacity and authority to do so by the Father. And he notes that no human hand can take these powers away from him, can strip the Father of his ability to delegate these things to him. And his declaration of oneness with the Father in verse 30 is echoed again later on in verses 37 to 38 of chapter 10. We can reconcile this with what Jesus will go on to say in the farewell discourse in chapter 14, verse 28, where he says that the Father is greater than he is, by noting that it's his deeds that reveal his oneness with the Father. If we were to read on in this chapter, we'd see that the exchange between Jesus and those of the temple establishment angered them to the point where they were ready, as verse 31 tells us, to try to stone Jesus to death. It shows us the violent opposition to who he was, and it surely dispels any idea that it was only in the events of Holy Week that this hostility between Jesus and other religious leaders arose. So it's a challenging passage. It invites us to think about how we can hear God's voice and be faithful to it and to wrestle with some of the complexities that the story throws up around things like why did the religious authorities question Jesus so much in the first place? And so with those thoughts in mind, we now turn to our set questions for this week. <laughs>